The next item of business is debate on motion 15184 in the name of Ben McPherson on the contribution of EU citizens to Scotland. May I ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons and I call on Ben McPherson to speak to and move the motion for up to nine minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, President Officer. It is a great privilege to begin this important debate and in doing so to recognise and emphasise on behalf of the Scottish Government and I know many others of the huge contribution that EU citizens have made uh, to Scotland and are making so today. Presiding Officer, the day after International Migrants Day and just hours after the UK Government has finally published its highly concerning wrong-headed immigration white paper. This debate today is an opportunity for us as a parliament to reaffirm our support for our friends, neighbours, colleagues and loved ones who have chosen to make Scotland their home and to focus on their well-being and to recognise the huge contribution they make to modern Scotland. Presiding officer, I would hope that every member of this chamber would want to say to the people who've come to study at and enhance our world-class colleges and universities. I hope that we would want to say to the people who've worked hard in businesses and public services right across the country, supporting their families and their communities, and to the people brought up here, born here even, who speak with a Scottish accent but have another European passport. Let us say to them, and this can't be said enough, Scotland is your home. You are welcome here. We want you to stay, and together we are stronger in diversity. Because, presiding officer, European migration has been good for Scots and for Scotland. This parliament knows the challenges that Scotland faces through long-term demographic trends, with an ageing population and not enough working age people coming through to replace those leaving the labour market, despite more people coming to Scotland uh, from the rest of the UK in recent years. EU migration has helped sustain the working age population and has boosted our economic growth. And that is why today's debate is important. And it's also why the UK government's white paper that was launched this afternoon is so concerning and wrong-headed and is deeply worrying for businesses and many others. Because, presiding officer, and this is also important, and even the UK government's key advisors on migration are clear about this, the positive impact of EU citizens has been immense. The UK government's Migration Advisory Committee, their key advisors, state that there is no evidence that EAA migration has reduced employment opportunities for UK citizens. There is no evidence that EAA migration has reduced wages for UK-born workers. And there is no evidence that migration has reduced the training opportunities available to British people. And it's important that we tackle and address any misnomers around these points. Because on the other hand, the key advisors to the UK government also emphasise that EAA migrants pay more in taxes than they receive in welfare benefits and consume in public services. And that EAA migrants contribute much more to the health service and the provision of social care in financial resources and through work than they consume in services. So the position on the positive impact of migration in evidential terms as well as in principle is clear, even from the UK government's Migration Advisory Committee. I will indeed. Kezia Dugdale. who said he thought there was no reason to think that cutting down immigration would harm the economy. What's his response to that? Uh, Minister, did you hear all of that question? Ms Dugdale's mic wasn't on initially. Yeah. I, I, I did. Thank ben you, McPherson. President Officer. And thank you, Kezia Dugdale, for that important intervention. I was going to, to say later, but I'll make the point now, that uh, I think Mr Javid's comments are, are erroneous and inaccurate. And our uh, modelling estimates that... Uh, taking into account of what's been proposed in the white paper for Scotland in itself, uh, would cost Scotland around 6.2% by 2040 in our GDP. That is an equivalent fall of almost 6.8 billion a year in GDP by 2040. We'd have a significantly detrimental impact. 
And also, that leads to the point that I wanted to make, which was also that our Scottish Government analysis has shown, and many will know this, that each EU citizen contributes £34,400 in GDP per year and also £10,400 in taxation. So the contribution is massive. Scottish Government analysis also shows that because of the important part EU citizens have played in our population turnaround, EU migration is relatively more important to Scotland than other parts of the UK. And I see that in my own constituency of Edinburgh, Northern and Leith, one of the most multicultural and vibrant places in Scotland. We see it across Scotland in our cities, our towns and in our rural communities. And that is why it is so important for Scotland that in the face of the current turmoil at Westminster and the two and a half years of uncertainty and anxiety that the UK government have caused for EU citizens, despite all of this, we need to support EU citizens here in Scotland and make sure they know they are welcome and feel welcome. And as part of this responsibility, I was pleased to announce yesterday, as many will be aware of, that we in the Scottish government will deliver an advice service for EU citizens in Scotland in partnership with Citizens Advice Scotland and their network of Citizens Advice Bureaus across the country. This will be over and above anything the UK government has planned, which has not been forthcoming, and to be frank, I don't think the UK government are doing enough. There is an urgent need for clear and trusted information about how people will be affected by changes in the immigration rules as a result of Brexit. And the geographical footprint of Citizens Advice Scotland, together with their trusted status and existing network of advisors, will allow the service we're we are funding to be delivered quickly across Scotland. This service is a practical step we can take to ensure that EU EEA citizens in Scotland feel welcomed, supported and valued. And I'm sure Parliament will agree it's the right thing to do. But, presiding officer, I wish this wasn't necessary and that people who have done us the honour of making Scotland their home didn't need to apply to retain their rights they already have. But faced with that situation as a result of Brexit, I hope that amidst the uncertainty, our commitment to provide support gives some comfort and surety. Because, presiding officer, since 2016, in the Scottish Government, we have been clear the Scottish Government will do all it can to help EU citizens through the process of obtaining settled status. And that is why we have also made a clear commitment to pay the fees for EU citizens working in our devolved public services, including doctors, nurses and other public sector workers on whom we all rely. However, this Scottish Government is also absolutely clear that EU citizens should certainly not be being asked to apply to retain the rights that they are already enjoying and have and, and, and have had for some time. And they should not, certainly should not be charged a fee for that application. Presiding officer, Parliament should be aware that I've raised this issue with the UK government and most recently with the UK immigration minister this morning. And we will continue to make the case that there should be no fee because frankly, it's insulting for the UK government to ask EU citizen relatives, friends, neighbours and colleagues to pay a fee to keep making such a huge contribution to Scotland. And it's not just the Scottish government that's calling for the fees to be scrapped. The overwhelming message from those I have spoken to, whether that's businesses, third sector organisations or EU citizens themselves, is that it is unfair that people are having to pay and apply simply to keep their existing rights to live, work and study in Scotland. A fee that not only applies just to adults, but to children as well. Very quickly. Does the Minister not accept that the fee to be charged is less than the fee that either he or I would have to pay to renew our passports? Ben McPherson. I, I thought Adam Tompkins would raise that example and I have to say I think the, the, the comparison is completely inappropriate and wrong-headed. We, when we buy a passport, we are not paying for our rights. And to ask people who contribute the huge amounts in GDP and taxation that these individuals do is insulting and wrong-headed. And I think the Conservatives should really think hard about their proposition because they are losing this argument. You can come to a close very I will quickly, come to a close. Please, I will talk more in my conclusion including remarks about the fee position and also the, the disastrous white paper that's been put forward. But let me be clear, presiding officer, let me state again that the people of Scotland should be at the heart of this issue. And the people of Scotland, of course, includes the EU citizens who have done us the compliment of making their home here. And I hope that this parliament will say today with one voice, maybe I'm being too hopeful with that, to our friends, neighbours, colleagues and loved ones, Scotland is your home. 
you are welcome here. We really want you to stay. I move the motion in my name. I now call on Adam Tompkins to speak to and move amendment 15184.2. Well, with those, with those closing remarks, I'm sure the whole of the parliament will speak with uh, one, one, one voice. There are tens of thousands of European citizens living in Glasgow, the city I represent, uh, and more than 220,000 across Scotland as a whole. And the minister is absolutely right to say, and I agree with him, that they are our friends, they are our colleagues, our partners, our neighbours. They work in education, in health, in banking, in finance, in manufacturing, in hospitality, in construction. They enrich our universities, our workplaces, and uh, our communities. And ever since the June 2016 referendum, presiding officer, the United Kingdom government has been absolutely clear how important it is to secure the rights of EU citizens in the United Kingdom and UK nationals in EU member states. This has indeed been the first priority in bilateral negotiations between the UK and the EU, a priority repeatedly stated by the Prime Minister. For example, in her Lancaster House speech in January 2017, Theresa May said this, we will continue to attract the brightest and the best to work and study in Britain. Indeed, openness to international talent must remain one of this country's most distinctive assets, but that process must be managed properly so that our immigration system serves the national interest. Let me just finish the quotation and then I'll happily give way. The Prime Minister went on to say this, Britain is an open and tolerant country. We will always want immigration, especially high-skilled immigration. We will always want immigration from Europe, and we will always welcome individual migrants as friends. On that issue, I think, and I hope, every member of this uh, parliament would agree. Happy to give way to Gillian, Gillian Martin. Martin. I thank you very much for, for like Adam Tomkins, very much for uh, taking my intervention. Uh, you mentioned about talent, attracting talent. Do you believe that talent is only something that you have if you're earning over £30,000 a year? Because that is something that uh, is, 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 is been put, is rooted as being the threshold. Always through the chair, please. Adam Tomkins. Uh, I thank the member for that question. No, I don't think that talent is something that begins only at £30,000 a year. That's a pr proposition, as I understand it, which is today being put out to public consultation. And I would urge every member of this parliament, and indeed the Scottish Government, to take part in that public consultation and, and to express their views um, forthrightly and uh, robustly. Um, uh, presiding officer, the Prime Minister said in her Florence speech in September 2017 that, and I quote, I want to repeat to all EU citizens who have made their lives in our country, we want you to stay, we value you, and we thank you for your contribution to our national life. <laughs> uh, Mr McPherson didn't say this in his speech, but when he used those words, he was, of course, quoting the United Kingdom Prime Minister. Um, the UK government... The UK government uh, more, more recently in November, just last, month, said, uh, just last month, said, and I quote again, EU citizens are valued members of their communities and play an integral part in the economic, cultural and social fabric of the UK, as do UK nationals living in the EU who are equally valued uh, by their host countries and communities. Happy to give way to the Minister. Ben McPherson. On these points, and I think they're important ones, does Mr Thompson regret the fact that the Prime Minister stated that EU citizens had been skipping the queue in coming to make the contribution that they do to the UK? I, I, I think, Adam Tompkins. I think the Prime Minister herself has distanced herself from, from those remarks and has apologised uh, for them. I want to move on, pres uh, Presiding Officer, to the withdrawal agreement. The withdrawal agreement, successfully negotiated by the Prime Minister and her team with the European Union, provides that all EU citizens lawfully residing uh, in the UK at the end of the implementation period will be able to stay in the UK. It also makes extensive, detailed and welcome provision for family members, children and dependents. This is what, of course, SNP ministers called for. So the question, presiding officer, is this. Why are SNP MPs now set to vote against this deal when it provides for what they called for? The withdrawal agreement provides that EU citizens who have been living lawfully in the UK for five years, I've already given way twice, uh, uh, the, the withdrawal agreement provides that EU citizens who have been living lawfully in the UK for five years at the end of, of the implementation period will have the right permanently to reside in the UK. Again, this is what the SNP demanded. In my view, they were right to demand it, but it's what the withdrawal agreement provides. So why is the SNP now minded to vote against it? Finally, presiding officer, the withdrawal agreement protects existing rights. Well, perhaps the minister can respond to these points when he winds up the debate, Mr Arthur. 
Um, the withdrawal agreement protects existing rights to equal treatment and non-discrimination for EU citizens residing or working in the UK and their family members. Broadly speaking, they will have the same entitlements to work, to study and to access public services and benefits as they do now, subject only to any future domestic policy changes that would apply equally to UK nationals. So I ask again, perhaps the Minister can respond to this when he winds up at the end of the debate. Given that this is what the SNP rightly called for, why is the SNP now minded to vote against this agreement when it, provi when it, pr when it uh, delivers exactly what the SNP said that they wanted? Now, we agree, uh, Presiding Officer, with the first half of the Scottish Government's motion today. But where we do not agree is with what I have to say with respect to the Minister is rather empty virtue signalling about fees. EU nationals with indefinite leave to remain will not have to pay a fee. And those who do pay will pay £65 if they are over 16 and £32.50 if they are under 16, which is significantly less than a British citizen would pay for a passport. Nor do we agree, nor do we agree that the United Kingdom needs a differentiated or devolved immigration system. Experts have warned that increased deviation is not helpful for the economy. A report published, for example, by the Migration Observatory at the University of Oxford stated that it is not clear that significant regional variation would lead to a better match between policy and regional economic needs. At the same time, regionalisation has an economic drawback, the report said, which is that a more complex immigration system would increase administrative burdens for its users, not just employers, but migrant labourers as well. The director of the CBI, of CBI Scotland has said the same. The F Food and Drink Federation Scotland has said the same. The Scottish Chambers of Commerce have said the same, as have NFU uh, Scotland. To conclude, uh, presiding officer, let me just say this. Brexit, uh, whether we voted for it or not, has facilitated the biggest change in our immigration system in more than four decades. And the new system will be based on an individual's skills, on what they can bring to this country, not their nationality, not on where they were born or where they come from. And that means that as we continue to grow the UK economy, we can seek we out people with the please. correct skills and asking them to make Great Britain their home. Thank you. I should say I move the amendment in my name. Now call on Claire Baker to speak to and move amendment 15184.1. <clears throat> Five minutes, please. And thank you, President Officer, and I very much welcome this afternoon's debate, which recognises the value of EU citizens to Scotland and makes it clear that they are welcome here. At this time of continuing indecision and uncertainty, even chaos and conflict within British politics, we must not lose sight of the impact of the political debate on people, both people who are born and raised in the UK and those who choose to come here to contribute to our society, invest in our economy and enrich our culture. The debate is often framed in terms of economic growth and that is an essential part of the contribution made by EU citizens. But we can't ignore the importance of the diversity they bring to our culture and our society and in its ability to enrich and enliven our everyday lives. It is depressing to look back over recent years at some of the reasons why we find ourselves in this fairly desperate situation, facing the possibility of leaving a union in ways which will make us poorer, less diverse and more isolated in international trade and relationships. The negative portrayal of migrants in the right-wing media was deplorable and goes some way to explaining support for a leave vote in areas which had low levels of migration. We've all had conversations on the doorstep when constituents who are concerned about their own jobs and their own housing needs tell us that it's migrants who are causing these problems. I always, politely as possible, explain that it is not the case and that migrants put more into our society than they take out and that the problems they identify are more about a need for investment in our public services and our economy, but these views do still exist. I, I'm very short of time, so... Tom Arthur. I welcome Claire Baker's remarks. Can she confirm that the Scottish Labour Party supports freedom of movement for EU nationals and UK citizens across the European Union? Claire Baker. I, mean, I think as you see in the speech, I will recognise the value of freedom of movement. Um, and I was hoping today could be a consensual debate. Obviously, the White Paper has been published today and we'll respond to the White Paper during that process. Um, last week, President Officer, I was at the launch of the forthcoming report into Brexit and EU citizens living in Scotland, which focuses on their experiences, their concerns and support needs since the EU referendum. 
As co-convener of the cross-party group on Poland, we had a discussion about the early stages on the research earlier this year and the final report of the EU Citizens' Rights Project Scotland, with support from the Scottish Government, is due to be published soon. It is a detailed piece of work which draws on conversations with EU citizens across Scotland after the EU referendum. And at this stage, President Officer, I will move the amendment as it recognises their work. People report feeling stressed by the lack of reliable and sufficiently detailed information on the EU settlement scheme and a lack of awareness among applying for settled status is reported, particularly among vulnerable groups, perhaps those who are isolated and or have a poor knowledge of English. The challenges of completing applications for those with little understanding of English, low computer skills and access and the ability to meet the application fee were also identified. And yes, it is an uh, announcement from the Minister to address some of these concerns along with this advice as welcome. The decision to leave the EU will remove the existing rights of EU citizens living in Scotland, many of whom might have been living here for a number of years. They have children at school, they have jobs and they run businesses, they are part of community councils and they are elected to local councils. Their connections to this country run deep. Their status is changing through no decision of their own, but surely we do want them to stay and continue contributing to our society. It is then unjustifiable to make them pay to retain their rights, which can be significant if a family all need to apply or difficult for someone to meet out of the cost of a minimum wage salary or a zero hours contract. Mm -hmm. Professor Manning, the chair of the Migration Tourism Committee, sorry, Migration Advisory Committee, gave evidence to the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Affairs Committee recently. And I have to say that committee members were astonished by his analysis of the Scottish economy. I, express, I support his expressed desire for a high-skill, high-wage economy, but I can't support the analysis that this was the result of the free movement of EU citizens or that their jobs are unskilled and thus can be redundant to our economy. We do not know where the Brexit negotiations are going to end up, what the outcome will be, but the white paper published today, we will have a very different immigration policy. And unless we see a policy which recognises the needs of different parts of the UK, there will become greater and greater calls for flexibility. Scotland faces significant demographic challenges in the coming years. Our population is ageing and our birth rate is not meeting predicted demands on our economy and our society. We face skill shortages in specific areas and we do have at the moment EU citizens working in many sectors across Scotland in education, in our health service, creating businesses and providing employment. And as part of the European Union, they were free to do that, and the UK would feel like an extension of their home country. This is all about to change. So we must redouble our efforts to make migrants feel welcome in Scotland, to be clear that they are a valuable part of our society, that we recognise and value the contribution that they make, and be clear that they are welcome to settle here, not just to be here to meet an economic need and then required to go once that is fulfilled, but to live here, to raise a family here, and to be part of our community. Their contribution is valued and we want to see it continued. The three opening speeches have all had over time. That has a knock-on effect to their colleagues uh, who participate in the open debate. So tight timings, please. Ross Greer, four minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Greens join our colleagues from the SNP and Labour in paying respect to the contribution of EU citizens and indeed to all people who choose to come and make Scotland their home. They've made Scotland a better place, culturally, socially and economically. We've had cause to debate the issues facing European citizens repeatedly in recent months. And each time I've talked about the benefits that free movement has brought to our education sector in particular. I've highlighted how West College Scotland takes part in Erasmus+, Plus, allowing students from Scotland to develop their skills in Denmark and Finland and vice versa. How UWS works with Dundalk Institute of Technology and Queen's University Belfast to conduct award-winning research. And it's not just EU funding or the Erasmus scheme that's driven these opportunities. It's free movement. Free movement has allowed our universities, our colleges and our schools, our research centres to benefit from thousands of talented staff from across Europe. Almost a quarter of the research staff at our world-class universities are EU citizens, as are 20,000 students. If we want to enjoy the full benefits of this, we need a system which is welcoming and attractive, one which attracts and retains workers, one which allows students to stay here after their studies. This is certainly what I believe is the instinctive desire of a majority of people in Scotland, and certainly a majority in this parliament. All across our society, we see the benefits that EU citizens have made in education, in health and social care, in hospitality and tourism and construction, and in every other sector of our economy. And all of this is endangered by the crude racism of the UK's Conservative government. 
EU citizens who want to come here after Brexit, if we don't stop it, will be subjected to the same degrading and inhumane hostile environment that those from the rest of the world currently face. Despite scandal after scandal, from the Windrush generation to EU citizens themselves being sent letters ordering them to leave the country, the situation is only getting worse. The Tories Home Secretary may prefer a new term, the compliant environment, as if that doesn't sound sinister enough to have come from the pages of 1984, excuse me, uh, but the same policies and practices of humiliation and callousness remain. Employers, landlords, the NHS, charities, banks and other services are expected to act like border force officials carrying out immigration checks. The Tories' priority is to deport first and let appeals happen later, as we saw with Windrush and elsewhere. There was a woman not that long ago, originally from Singapore, married to a British citizen for 27 years, for whom she's his primary carer. She's a grandmother, a mother of two British children, and she was torn from her home and put on a flight. That woman has finally been granted a UK visa over £55,000 later. She was fortunate to have raised that through public funding, but no amount of money will undo the trauma of being forced from your home and deported, and we cannot crowdfund for everyone's basic rights. This is a system that's cruel by design, but which also has a shocking level of incompetence almost baked into it. The UK government's new procedure for offering settled status to EU citizens is meant to allow applications via smartphone, but only works on one operating system. So no luck if you've got an iPhone, the most popular handset in the country. If you can't use the smartphone app, you can go to one of the government's locations that offer ID document scanning. But there's only one office in Scotland, in Edinburgh. So that's not much use to an EU citizen in Ullapool or Stromness or Stranraer and you need to pay for the privilege, as Mr. Tomkins said. Even children will be charged. And the UK government won't let EU citizens in our public sector have their employer, the Scottish government, pay for them. This is an ideology of hostility. No wonder there's no faith in the Home Office to administer settled status. It's no surprise to see the latest decision to impose a £30,000 minimum income threshold for migrants, including European citizens, after Brexit, and restrict lower-skilled migration to single-year visas, only compounding the problem of precarious work. This is the kind of crass, cack-handed intervention which tears people's lives apart, it undermines our culture and our society, and it hammers our economy. Many European citizens in Scotland today will Just first closing. arrive. Many European citizens in Scotland today will first arrive earning far less than thirty thousand pounds, or with no job at all. I earned far less than thirty thousand pounds before I had this job. This is going to cause a decline in our working age population and undermine our economy for absolutely no good reason. It's clear that this Parliament must have the powers to set our own migration policy, one that is humane and one which meets the needs of this country. Willie Rennie, four minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. I, I listened carefully to what Adam Tompkins said earlier on this afternoon, and, and it's a rare thing that I do listen to Adam Tompkins, but it was, it did happen this afternoon. And I'm sure he is sincere with what he talks about in terms of immigration and being a welcoming country. It would be better, however, if he had more influence over his colleagues in Westminster, because the... <laughs> he says from a sedentary position that he wishes to have more influence as well. And I agree with him on that, because if we did, we might not have the immigration paper that was published today, because there is no doubt that it's going to be damaging for our country. The CBI said very clearly uh, earlier on today that this would be a sucker punch for many firms. The Federation of Small Businesses said the proposals don't meet our needs. It will be nigh impossible to access non-UK labour with the skills that are required. And the British Retail Consortium said it will put um, pressure on prices of goods and services. So the impact on the economy will be significant um, from this white paper today. Charging EU citizens to keep the rights they already have, I think is rather an insult to them and the contribution that they have made to our country. To even qualify for this settled status, you need to have lived in this country for five years in a row. If you have contributed to the country for that long, paying that much tax, contributing to your community, undertaking important roles, perhaps in the public service or in businesses, then you should not be thanked with an invoice for £65. Of course, the simplest way to abolish this charge would be to abolish Brexit. That would get rid of all of this problem in one fell swoop. And I'm sure many in this chamber uh, would agree with that sentiment. And that is what I am determined to continue to pursue. Uh, we know that immigration can be good for the country. Many have said that this afternoon already. 
It helps with the demographic challenges, with the real challenge of the ageing population and a shrinking workforce relative to that population means that we're finding it more difficult to raise the taxes that we need to pay for the services that are growing and ever more demanding. We also know that many of these workers that come from Europe are actually providing a fantastic service for many local firms, including the fruit and veg firms in my constituency. They are part of a growing food and drink sector that hopes to double in value by 2030. With the new technology, we can extend the growing season, but that means we need more workers for those businesses. Yet, with the exchange rate change and also the impact of Brexit, fewer of them are coming to this country. So we've got rotting veg and fruit in our fields as a result. The new seasonal scheme for non-EU workers is a step in the right direction, but it fails to make up for the losses of EU workers. We were always going to require to look beyond the EU for more workers. That was true. But the Brexit scenario has crushed the situation into a very short period, and we're going to have to deal with the, the consequences of Brexit by bringing even more people in to make up for the loss of people from the European Union. But the Conservative government are showing no signs of understanding the real needs of businesses. And that's another thing that Adam Tonkins should be saying to his colleagues eh, at Westminster. But it doesn't just apply to seasonal workers. It also applies to processing plants like kettle produce and marine harvest in Fife that require large numbers of people all year round. And there's one thing to be sure about. If we are insisting that people should have assets of £30,000 before they can stay in this country. That is going to repel an awful lot more people from the European Union. It's much easier to go to France or to Germany where those requirements are not in place. Many of the workers come from Europe. We should be welcoming them to this country rather than repelling them. Thank you. We now move to the open debate. As I said, time, timing is tight. Four minute speeches, please, no more than that. Gillian Martin, followed by Alexander Stewart. Thank you, sir. According to a recent report, the local authority with the highest proportion of its EU nationals in, is in, in employment is Aberdeenshire. And I cannot understate how much of a contribution people from across the EU make to my home in the North East and what life they have injected back into some of, of our sectors, in particular who struggled to compete with the oil industry to recruit. Sectors like nursery care, fish processing, healthcare, public administration, higher education, transport, hospitality, and the various skilled trades involved in construction. The message needs to be emphasized continually, loudly and clearly, that more than 95% of EU nationals of working age are in employment and their tax revenue helps us fund the services which care for us, our ageing population and our children. EU nationals who have made their, the North East their home, well, they're our colleagues, our friends, our children's teachers, nurses and doctors, and in the case of Councillor Anouk Kloppert, a Dutch national and adopted Scot, and former MSP and now Aberdeen City Councillor Christian Allard, French national and adopted Scot, they are serving as elected representatives. And I'm sure my colleagues in Glasgow would proudly, proudly name check Provost Eva Balander, originally a Swedish national, and Ayrshire councillor Joy Brahim, originally from the Netherlands. I also want to pay tribute to the many, many students that I have taught as a college lecturer from other EU countries. Our classrooms and lecture halls have been all the richer places for their presence there. A great many of the people we call neighbours, colleagues and friends who came to Scotland from other EU countries would have found it impossible in the proposed immigration system the UK government is set to adopt post-Brexit and with a 30,000 income cap on skilled migrants being proposed. I genuinely also don't know what is proposed for students and uh, those that want to stay and work and contribute here post-study. £30,000 may be a pittance to the likes of Th Theresa May or Sajid Javid, but it is not for most of our citizens. I have spoken many times in this chamber about the detrimental impact will have this Brexit will have on university research. Most postgraduate and doctoral researchers are not on salaries above 30,000, yet it's their work which has helped to uh, lead to breakthrough research in many fields. The Scottish Government has made it clear that we want EU and EEA citizens and their families to continue to make their lives in Scotland and we know only too well that our Government does not have the powers 
over immigration. And I agree with Ross Greer, we desperately need these powers, particularly after what's been released today. This time last year, Naveen Aziz, a dentist with a practice in my constituency and a number of others around the North East and Highlands, he raised concerns with me about how he was going to fill vacancies. Mr Aziz told me that since the Brexit vote, the interest from EU trained candidates in vacancies has completely fallen away. He said problems were made worse by the changes in visa rules, which limits the number of visas available for dentists outside the EU. At the time, we checked with the Home Office about the amount of visas available for dentists, and they were the same number available to ballet dancers, and I am not making that up. Changes in NHS dentistry by the Scottish Government meant an end to people queuing all along the street for precious NHS places, ensuring easy access to oral health. But we can't, can't staff the vacancies with Scottish-born graduates alone. Replicate that story across all areas of healthcare, and we have a looming crisis. And, presiding officer, none of this was our making. The last sentence that I want to say in this chamber in this year of particular bre Brexit mismanagement is this. Scotland did not vote to leave the EU, yet it is we who are paying the highest price. Thank you. I call Alexander Stewart to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Thank you, presiding officer. I'm pleased to be able to take part in today's debate on the contribution of EU citizens to Scotland. The contribution indeed has extremely been beneficial and positive economically, socially and culturally. The UK government has always recognised this as an important fact. They have been quite clear from the very start of the negotiations on a withdrawal from the European Union that securing the status of EU nationals currently living in the UK was a priority. At the same time, they wanted to ensure that protection of rights for those UK nationals currently living in other parts of the EU. And indeed, the rights of EU citizens are protected by the proposed withdrawal agreement that has been negotiated. The arrangements demonstrate that there is a clear willingness and commitment on both sides to guarantee the rights of EU and UK citizens and their families who make their current contribution and that have been doing that through the freedom of movement prior to our withdrawal uh, to the European Union. Happy to do so. Will um, any? I commend him for the words that he said, but is he therefore just a tad embarrassed by the UK immigration paper published today? Alexander Stewart. The paper today sets out many priorities and we will have plenty of time to discuss that in the future, I have no doubt. People voted to leave for many different reasons. For some, it was a question of sovereignty. For others, it was about economic opportunity. And yes, for some, it was about greater control over immigration. But it was not about rejecting immigration altogether. A vote to leave the European Union has often been misconstructed by this. This simply was not the case. The fact public polling has consistently shown that the majority of people in the UK are in favour of no restrictions on skilled migration, but want to see elements of controls on unskilled migration. This is a reasonable and considerable and a mainstream position. I would like to make some more progress, time is tight. Having the ability to reconsider the approaches of migration in the United Kingdom will allow us to make systems fairer for those who wish to stay. The approach that has been set up by the UK government is indeed a sensible one which takes the needs of all sectors of the economy into account. For example, these remaining to demand and unskilled labour outside the UK and work in particular sectors and particular times of the year as fruit and veg farmers already has been discussed. The UK government has recognised this and are trialling a scheme that will allow farmers to employ migrant workers for seasonal work up to six months and not to have shortages during peak production periods. We must, however, also remember the significance of migration in Scotland from the rest of the UK. That is very important. While 33,000 people moved to Scotland from overseas in 1617, 48,000 people came to Scotland from the rest of the UK. Just as trade, we trade with four times as much with the rest of the UK as we do with the EU. The most important single market of labour to Scotland is the United Kingdom. And this is exactly why we are calling for, and individuals who are calling for a, a distinct migration system for Scotland are mistaken. Concerns have been raised by representatives from important organisations of our economy, including CBI Scotland, the Food and Drink Federation Scotland, the Scottish Chamber of Commerce and NFU Scotland. 
It would create unnecessary additional bureaucracy, particularly for firms who operate on both sides uh, in Scotland and the rest of the UK. And it is unlikely to address a wider problem in Scotland's poor economic performance. Uh, in conclusion, uh, presiding officer, we all value the important contribution <coughs> made to life in Scotland by those who have moved here for the, uh, and from the rest of the EU and look forward to the contributions that they will make from the future migrants who will come here. The UK government is tackling this in a sensible, proportionate way for the future migration, and we should all welcome the opportunity shape of a new fairer immigration system. And I support the amendment in Adam Tompkins' name. Thank you. Thank you, and I call Fulton McGregor to be followed by Kezia Dugdale. Yeah, thank you, President Officer. It's a great honour to be speaking in this debate today. I think it's fair to say that the Minister and uh, other colleagues, including Gillian Martin, have articulated <laughs> well the benefits EU citizens have in our economy, their population levels, their businesses, their public sector and our culture and our very sense of identity. These are our family and our friends and we should do everything in our power to make sure that their rights are respected. But, President Officer, it won't surprise you that I am going to focus my remarks on the local impact in my constituency. Um, just two weeks ago, I held a surgery for EU nationals living in Coatbridge and Chrysan. I lettered every EU national across the constituency to let them know about the day and that I am there to support them. I took these steps as it became very clear to me through casework that the Brexit vote and current discussions, if we can actually call it that, has caused a lot of concern among EU nationals who call Scotland their home. The event was very well attended. Normally, this would be something to boast about for an MSP, but in this case, I think it was very well attended because people are simply so worried. We have citizens from all over the EU, Spain, France, Greece, Poland, Romania, Portugal, Germany, all valued members of our society, frightened that they wouldn't be able to stay where they have made their home. And it's very clear that there's a lot of confusion, and I was asked by people there that day, for example, how much it would cost for them to stay, what would happen to their homes they had bought, what rights their children who were born here had, where they stood with their permanent jobs they were committed to, and the pensions they had contributed to, what access they would have to health care, and much more. And sadly, presiding officers, as others have articulated, there isn't a straight answer because Theresa May's Tory government can't come to any kind of agreement about how we move forward through this mess. And this is not just simply party politics. This is real people's lives and an insult to the hard-working, indispensable and skilled EU nationals who call Scotland their home. And that's why I have been glad to see some of the steps taken by the Scottish government outlined by Ben McPherson, including the... Um, uh, as released yesterday, the, the 800,000 to the Citizens Advice Bureau to help EU citizens. And at this point, I would like to personally thank um, Maria, who supported the event two weeks ago from my constituency, um, a Polish EU national who, uh, as I say, supported the event and provided a translation service. She was absolutely invaluable. And if uh, the Minister uh, could use her advice and services at any point, I would be happy to pass her contact details. But I want to finish, um, presiding officer, by talking about this proposed EU settled status. The fee is £60. And the more I think about this, the more I just think this is some sort of joke. Now, £60 might, not, might, sound, might not sound a lot to the Tories to my left here, but to some of the folk at that EU surgery a couple of weeks ago, it is one barrier too many. People struggling to find secure employment or having to negotiate the welfare system, including universal credit, bring up their families and make ends meet. But there's actually another issue here, as others have said. The principle of the matter. We are asking people who have lived here, sometimes for a long time, to pay for the right to do so. Just think about that. How inhumane is that? And I spoke to two people in particular, both who have been here many decades, made Scotland their home. And I hear there's huff in there, but they might want to listen to this. Brought up their families here and have paid taxes through their employment. And one of these people told me that although through her work she could afford the settlement fee, she didn't any longer feel welcome. The 1990s we're talking about, she's been here since, and she's been really upset by this. The other individual felt the same. That, for me, is the issue. The rhetoric around Brexit has led to an uncaring and cold UK government trying to appease the far right of its ranks. But on the ground, this is the actual effects. People in tears at MSP surgeries, feeling they're not welcome in their own homes. This is not on, presiding officer, and ask for the, as others for the immediate scrapping of these fees. And if they won't allow us to do that from the UK government, then let us take a different path in Scotland. Simply, presiding officer, I'd like to echo the Minister's message to all EU nationals in my constituency and across Scotland. This is your home, you are valued, and I will support you and fight for your rights. Thank you.
Thank you. I call Kezia Dugdale to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Thank you, President Officer. And can I start by commending Fulton McGregor on the initiative of holding a, a surgery in his constituency for EU nationals. I think that's a hugely positive step, and I'm sure colleagues across the uh, chamber who have constituencies might uh, likely replicate that, having heard your work in that regard. Um, can I first of all say to the Minister, I fully support the motion in front of us. Uh, I do have a bone to pick with the title of it, though, because he's entitled it The Contribution of EU Citizens to Scotland. I'm an EU citizen. We're all EU citizens, and it's to my great regret that I'm going to lose that part of my identity come next March. I hope, and I still think there's a glimmer of possibility that we might yet stay, but the reality is that from March next year, there will be two types of people in Scotland. EU migrants will become something other, something secondary, because of what the UK government is about to do to them, and that is something that I deeply regret. Can I also say uh, to the Minister and indeed to the, the Chamber that the Labour Party I joined was passionately pro-European. It didn't just support European Union and the concept of the European Union, it defended it and the all four freedoms that came with it. And the fact that the Labour Party no longer supports the free movement of people, to me, is also something that I deeply regret. And it's something I find very hard to reconcile, not only with my own principles, but with the economic and social needs of this country. And I can't believe that we have a Labour Party today, and I've said this before, that is more comfortable with talking about the free movement of widgets than it is the free movement of people. And I would encourage more of my colleagues to speak up in that regard. What I want to talk about uh, today is the remarks of Sajid Javid uh, and the policy that's been announced by the UK government. But before I do that, just take a moment to thank the 39,000 EU nationals that live and work in this city that I'm proud to represent. And I want to thank them not just for their work, but for choosing to make their life in this city. Uh, that's something uh, that I don't think gets recognised enough. It enriches this city and it enriches the lives of all of the citizens within it and our collective culture. And the last time I spoke in this chamber, I spoke about the social care crisis in this city and, and how I feel about that. And I know that that is going to be compounded by the impact of leaving the European Union because so many of the care workers in this city are EU nationals. It's self-inflicted pain. Moving on to what Sajid Javid said today, first of all he said there was no reason to think that his plans to reduce immigration would harm the economy. I find that astonishing because every bit of evidence I've seen points to the exact opposite. It then got worse because when he was asked what level of immigration he thought the level should be set at, he said it should be set at a level that meets first our economic need but at the same time is not too high a burden on our communities or our infrastructure. Let's call that out for what it is, which is dog whistle anti-immigration sentiment. The idea that immigrants are somehow a burden on our communities or an infrastructure is, what's got, is what got us here in the first place. It's not immigration which is a burden, it's austerity which is the burden. That's what's compounding the problems facing our housing, facing our NHS. And I've heard in the last few hours, some people and some trade union leaders call this metropolitan moralising, trying to discount the reasons why people are pro-immigration. And I don't accept that. I think it's a failure upon all of us for decades to defend the benefits of immigration. And I take my own responsibility for that. But I'm damn sure I'm going to do it now. In the final 20 seconds that I have, President Officer, can I say to the Minister, I commend him for the stance he's taking on trying to ensure that no public sector workers have to pay a fee in order to stay and work here after we leave the European Union. In his closing remarks, can I ask him if such a commitment extends as far as to perhaps operating a grant system to EU nationals working in the public sector so they get that money in advance and then they choose how they use that if they want to stay and I very much hope that they do stay and continue to contribute to our economy and our country. Thank you. I call Stuart McWillan to be followed by Rachel Hamilton. Thank you very much, President Officer. President Officer, I'm pleased to be speaking in this debate today, but I'm also frustrated that the debate needs to take place. Surely, surely every member of this chamber would have understood and also appreciated how important immigration actually is to Scotland's economy and also to Scotland's society. Surely every member would actually welcome the contribution of EU nationals to our country. Unfortunately, not is the clear answer that we've heard this afternoon. As is their want, the Tories once again set out on the crusade to defend the undefensible. Saying officer, I find that the settled status uh, fee uh, being implemented by the UK government to be nothing short of being appalling. Now, I welcome the Scottish Government's commitment 
uh, to meet the fee uh, for the EU citizens working in devolved public services, as well as providing them with the information and also advice. And uh, I, I generally welcome the, the £800,000 project uh, that the Minister spoke of earlier on. But it is somewhat unfortunate that these EU citizens need to pay to retain the rights that they already hold. If only there was a way to fix this problem. Also, the economic modelling shows that, on average, every additional EU citizen working in Scotland contributes some £34,400 in GDP, and that's £10,400 in government revenue. And with a total contribution by EU citizens working in Scotland at approximately £4.42 billion per annum, then I, for one, know that our economy, but also our society, will be much the poorer as Westminster drives people away. Now, today's white paper by the UK government is clearly a, a pathway for the rich, but a closed door for the public sector. Now, NHS provider's Deputy Chief Executive, Saffron uh, Cordery, is quoted as saying, uh, we are deeply concerned about what is uh, going to happen. High skills does not equal high pay. It is not just health uh, workers, it is, <coughs> it is social care as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, Claire Baker, uh, in her contribution, mentioned um, the Migration Advisory Committee and the Culture uh, Committee session we had with uh, Professor Manning uh, a few weeks ago. Now, in that um, session, uh, I asked, uh, asked some questions regarding the, the social sector. And to say that I was unimpressed by Professor Manning's contribution is an understatement, particularly his comments regarding care providers. And his suggestion was that care providers should really just pay more wages to their staff. Now, I think everyone would accept pay more wages is a good thing, but that's not always feasible. Uh, and the lack of appreciation about Scotland's tourism sector was also fully in show by Professor Manning. And certain issues raised by my colleagues Kenneth Gibson, also Tabby Scott, uh, clearly highlighted that there has been no economic modelling done by the, by the Migration Advisory Committee about Scotland. Standing officer, migration is normal. Immigration is normal. And the contribution from EU citizens to our economy and society is rich beyond any financial analysis. Now, Scotland's tartan is rich in colour, and it's also vibrant in its culture. Our tartan isn't just white with a, a bit of ginger on the fringes. It's white, it's black, it's yellow, it's blue, it's red, it's green, it's orange, it's brown. It's every single colour and every single creed. Now, growing up in Port Glasgow, I knew, that people from, I knew people from many different backgrounds. Uh, some people from Ireland, some from Australia, New Zealand, China, Kenya, and Pakistan. Representing officer, every person I have met has made my life and also my community and our country the richer. Now, I want Scotland to continue to welcome more Fabianis, more Allards, uh, more Ahmeds to Scotland. Now, they are all welcome, but unfortunately, the rhetoric, the rhetoric from this UK government hasn't lived up to this. Let's also not forget, let's not forget actually, uh, the UK government's comments a number of months ago in terms of the U in terms of Brexit agreement. Nothing is agreed until it's all agreed. Signing officer, uh, in conclusion, EU citizens are scared about what's going on at the moment. And no matter what was said today in London, that's not going to make the situation any better for them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr McMillan. I call Rachel Hamilton to be followed by Willie Coffey. Presiding officer, we know that EU workers make a fantastic contribution to Scotland's economy, especially in the hospitality and tourism industry. We must continue to make the Scottish hospitality and tourism industry a welcoming and attractive sector in which to work for both EU nationals and those born and bred here. And on that note, I refer members to my register of interests. Currently, there are two main points which I must address in this debate. Firstly, uh, that the Prime Minister has made it clear that EU citizens' rights are protected post-Brexit. And secondly, that immigration policy divergence in Scotland would not be beneficial for our economy, which is both agreed by the Food and Drink Scotland and the Scottish Chamber of Commerce. Presiding officer, I hope to raise some points of accord within this chamber today. And on that point, turning to the findings of the UK Hospitality Workforce Commission 2030 report, UK hospitality eloquently set out recommendations aimed at ensuring that our hospitality industry is fit for the future. They highlight that an immigration policy must be evidence-based, tailored to hospitality workforce needs. Moreover, that the industry should achieve greater workforce diversity, both EU and non-EU, and that government support for workforce upskilling to encourage older workers into the sector or back into employment. I don't think I can. I've got a lot of points to make. I'm sorry 
um, to the member. UK hospitality note that, and I quote, MPs and witnesses suggested developing temporary visas for seasonal work, similar to those called by the agricultural industry, to support the hospitality and tourist industry post-Brexit. As we all know, there is a large demand in the summer months for hospitality staff, especially in the highlands and islands, and with a dip over the winter months. And this is the case across the UK, in Pembrokeshire and in Cornwall, and in London in particular. Industry has already welcomed these ideas. For example, the boss of Costa Coffee owner, Whit uh, Whitbread, welcoming so-called barista visas. It is now our opportunity to inform a 12-month consultation on the white paper. We need to look closely at the current immigration tier system, as the MAC report suggests, and make reforms accordingly. They argue we need to make changes to the tier two visa system, scrapping the cap for high-skilled workers, widening the jobs uh, the, wide, the, the range of jobs permitted and reducing bureaucracy. There needs to be a better understanding of what is low and medium skilled jobs, particularly when it comes to chefs and sommeliers. The, the white paper is not final and we have the opportunity uh, to contr contribute to the consultation. I hope each and every one of us will do that. Presiding officer, one important fact remains. For too long, we have rested on our laurels with a plent plentiful supply of labour. The Scottish Tourism Alliance have warned for years that um, we will have a skill shortage in the hospitality industry. This has been going on for a decade, long before Brexit. I don't want to take away from the debate today, but it is the failure of this government to ensure that we tackle that skills gap effectively. Mark Crowfell from the STA had reiterated these concerns and yet it took until September uh, for the First Minister to announce in Aaron that she will commit to developing a specific campaign to promote tourism as a career choice. In conclusion, presiding officer, it's vital we absolutely recognise the contribution that EU workers make in Scotland, but in doing so, recognise that we need action on ensuring that we have an immigration system which reflects the needs of the economy, of those sectors, particularly the tourism and hospitality sector. Just to remind members, um, around 27,000 EU workers currently work within that sector. We absolutely welcome EU workers, and to, despite what the SNP like to spin, the number of EU uh, migrants in Scotland has continued to increase in the wake of Brexit, with 4,000 more moving to Scotland um, compared to in 2017. And again, that doesn't take away from the debate today. We must realise that the first priority of the UK government in the process of leaving the UK has always been to secure the status of EU citizens living here and the UK nationals living in the EU. Thank you. Thank you. I call Willie Coffey. Thanks, President Officer. The motion rightly highlights the valuable contribution to Scotland made by our European Union friends over so many years and rightly calls out the UK Government for its disgraceful treatment of people who call this place home. Can you imagine how it must feel to live your life with your family and friends in Scotland, making a huge contribution to what defines us as a nation, of just being a part of this place, and then suddenly being made to feel unwelcome and that you will have to apply to keep rights that you thought were yours for so long? That one act has caused so much damage to those relationships built up over so many years. The fee is not the important issue here, although yet again Scotland has stepped in and offered to pay it. It's the principle that's wrong. It sends out a message that our European friends are suddenly no longer part of us, separate, and to be treated as applicants in a new process that reeks of division and brings credit to no one. Ending freedom of movement might appeal to right-wing Tories, but it's a disgraceful policy that smacks of racism and xenophobia. It will seriously impact on our ability to grow our economy, but it also damages our country's reputation too. Scotland will fight this and reverse it as soon as we possibly can. Just take a look around the complex of our parliament here in Edinburgh. Many of our wonderful staff have come from all parts of Europe to live and work here with us. The UK government should not be treating them in this way and this application process should not proceed. Of course, it's not the only example of how badly the UK government is treating its people. I mentioned last week here in the chamber the case of my constituent, Laura Nanny, who despite living in Scotland for 34 years from the age of four, is now being told that she can't demonstrate that she is habitually resident in the UK and has been denied access to the most basic assistance through the universal credit system. An absolute disgrace. She has provided all the evidence that she can, employment information, family registrations, with all her children, all born in Scotland, 
GP, dental records, tax and national insurance, stretching back years and years. She's attended college and university, but still to no avail. What else does she have to do? She and her family and hundreds of thousands like her have paid tax, national insurance, VAT for decades, with no questions asked by the UK government until now. This is a shocking way to treat a person who is as Scottish as you and me. It's a symptom of the same treatment being meted out to our European friends under the guise of taking back control of borders. And the UK government's white paper on immigration issued today makes matters even worse. It could mean a reduction of 85% in the number of EEA workers <coughs> being allowed to work in Scotland. I pay, I pay tribute to Laura's family, Italian dad Enrico and Scottish mum Rita, who decided to make Scotland their home in 1984. Like so many other Italian people coming to Asia, local families like the Tugninis, Varanis, Bordonis, Sinferianis, Didianis and Giustis, to mention only a few, have shaped our communities for generations now and we are all the better for it. The welcome they received was warm and their contribution has been immense. But to now cast doubt over this enduring relationship surely has to be the lowest of the low. It's the start of second-class citizen status. Kezia Dugdale mentioned that earlier, and it's being introduced by the Tories. Presiding officer, Scotland needs a healthy migrant population to come here and work to help us grow our economy. All of our expected population growth over the next decade will come only from migration, most of it from overseas. But it's surely about more than economics. It's about citizenship, friendship, collaboration, shared values, sharing our cultures and traditions, living, working and studying together. And in Laura and Annie's family's case, marrying and settling down to make Scotland their home. We mustn't and shouldn't put a price tag in any of that. Grazie per ascoltarmi. Thank you. And we move to our closing speeches. Pauline McNeill to be followed by Jamie Green. Thank you very much. EU citizens are welcome here. They are valued. They are wanted. And this country would not be the country it is without them. It does need to be said. And there does need to be a consensus in this chamber of all the parties. Because EU citizens need to know that that is the all-out consensus of all the political parties in the Scottish Parliament. Because they've had a long wait, a long wait to learn uh, of their fate and how they will be treated. It might be common sense, it might be philosophical to support EU migration. But the facts on the ground is that we need it. Our economy needs it, we need the skills, and we need it to grow our population. Our EU citizens made their homes here and they made it in good faith. They did not know that David Cameron was going to call a referendum and some of them have actually voted in that referendum and did not know that their lives would be severely impacted on. Others have said that the language used in this debate is deeply concerning and I know that the Prime Minister has apologised but it is unfortunate that she did use that phrase of queue jumping. I don't think it's, it's a phrase that will be forgotten about um, for a long time to come. At last, we have some clarity, at least for EU citizens living lawfully. Um, they will have some understanding of what their, their rights are. Um, but the fee that they've been asked to pay is not a passport. It seems to me that they've been asked to pay for what they thought was existing rights they already have. And in actual fact, if you look at the arithmetic, it's, it looks as if they're actually paying the administration costs to actually confirm that they have the right to settle. It's a wrong decision, a bad decision. Uh, but of course, the scheme is going to be hugely complex and a very tight time scale to boot. It had the potential to go seriously wrong. The registration scheme is being built from scratch. And you wonder what happens for those who do not register by June 2021. Even if 5% don't register, um, that's a lot of EU citizens out of that three and a half million. So to deal with the announcement we had today, uh, maybe there is a consensus on the Chamber that establishing a criteria that a high skill is someone who earns £30,000, uh, well, above £30,000, 
is um, something that is deeply, deeply concerning. Uh, there's often no correlation between high skills and high wages. Uh, early career researchers, technicians in many professions will fall below that figure. Uh, and it's not just people in this chamber, members in this chamber saying that. It's been said by University of Scotland, it's been said by NHS and so on. UK immigration policy post-Brexit will make it more difficult to attract talent according to University of Scotland. Um, so we've had the, the Minister today set out um, the policy on immigration and as Kesa Dugdale said earlier, um, Sabah Javid has said that there's no reason to think the plans uh, would harm the economy. Seriously, uh, whatever you think of the scheme that we are that we're looking at today, it is utterly flawed to identify the highly skilled people who are always going to be uh, earning above £30,000. Um, I have to say to Rachel Hamilton and Alexander Stewart, who have talked in this chamber on many occasions very eloquently about the problems of the hospitality industry, you are completely underplaying the problem if you think that asking people to come here for six and a six month visa with no right to stay or live is going to solve the problem. Really, you really need to challenge your own government and stand up for the sector that you have so brilliantly. <laughs> It's just not going to work. And on conclusion, presiding officer, Scotland needs a regional immigration policy. 48% of people voted to remain and support freedom of movement. Scotland needs to grow its population and we need the UK government in the interest of the union to recognise there should be a regional variation on the question of immigration. Thank you. I call Jamie Green to close for the Conservative Party. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I've appreciated the majority of the tone uh, of this afternoon's debate, especially on a subject like uh, migration. And listening to the contributions, I think there is a consensus in the Parliament on the overall premise that migration from other countries contributes immensely to both meeting the unfulfilled needs of our employment sectors, but also uh, equally and just as importantly adds to the richness of our society. And I think the contribution from those who have made Scotland their home is overwhelmingly positive. Uh, no one on these benches have disagreed with that. And as somebody who has traveled, lived, uh, and worked myself in other countries, both within and out with the EU, I understand what migration means to live and work in someone else's country, to adapt to new customs, new languages, and new cultures. And the majority of people embrace that with both hands. But just as we focus in this debate around the uh, 223,000 uh, people from the EU who have made Scotland their home, uh, we should not forget about the contribution of the 135,000 people from outside of the EU who have also chosen to settle in this country and make it their home. Uh, in the uh, short time I have, I'd like to make a few points that I thought are important in the debate today. Uh, the first of all was made at the right at the beginning, the outset of this debate, that ensuring the rights of EU citizens who are currently in the UK should be guaranteed whatever the outcome of Brexit. It was and remains, in my view, the right thing to do. Many people were calling for guaranteed rights of EU citizens and their families to remain in the, EU, uh, in the UK. Many people were calling for the rights of those citizens uh, uh, including their entitlements to work, study and access public services or benefits should remain uh, uh, regardless of what happens with Brexit and also the rights of UK citizens, including many Scots who've chosen to make other countries their home. They should all be protected. The withdrawal agreement does that as a matter of priority. And if we strip away some of the political uh, heaving and hoeing around deal or no deal, I think there remains a serious point if the deal that is on the table does do that, a deal that was mutually agreed between the UK and the EU27, it remains a mystery to me why we would oppose that settlement. <laughs> if it's very brief, uh, Mr McMillan. Stuart McMillan. I thank Jamie Green for taking the intervention. Would Jamie Green agree with me that the reason why the SNP MPs uh, do, not, do not want to support that, uh, that, failed, well, that failing deal that's on the table is because it actually will have an adverse effect upon Scotland's economy. It will put Scotland at an economic disadvantage. Is that what Mr Green actually wants? Jamie Green. Uh, look, the, the withdrawal agreement is the agreement that deals with our departure 
uh, from the EU and sets out the premise of the next steps in negotiation of future trade uh, relationships. Uh, the future trade relationship will be for another debate for when we have much more time to debate that. What it does do, and what's relevant to this debate, is it guarantees the rights of EU citizens in the UK. I want to do that, and I'm surprised that Mr. Mr. McMillan and his benches don't. Yeah. It's a mystery. I can also make another point uh, that controlled immigration does not mean no uh, immigration. Right. Uh, very few, indeed, if any countries in the world have unrestricted uh, immigration. We will continue to, and we will have to, continue to welcome people into this country. I've looked through the white paper and I think there are a number of key points in it that I think we haven't talked about. There's been a lot of negative uh, views on it and it's, it's, it's a complex uh, issue. Um, for it, first of all, the important point to point out is the cap on tier two workers will be lifted. Um, now, Gillian Martin, her speech is concerned about the number of dentists in the Northeast and rightfully so. Just as I am concerned about the number of uh, medical consultants at Crosshouse hospital. So surely the removal of that cap would be a welcome move. Uh, this current system, the current system gives uh, suitably qualified doctors in Madrid more preference than say one from Manila. And that's a byproduct of the status quo. But if the status quo is changing, and it is changing, I've got, uh, if I could finish, the status quo is changing. Therefore the visa system must change too to deal with that change in circumstances. Tier two workers make up around 40% of healthcare workers. It's not an insignificant number. Now, Scotland has a, a skill shortage across a wide range of areas, and, and I could go into them in great detail. But if this new system addresses some of those skill shortages, I welcome it. In conclusion, presiding officer, as we've made clear today, there's very little to disagree with the many points made right across the chamber. As Stuart McMillan said, immigration is normal. I don't disagree with that. But perhaps it is for the very reason that we have been too afraid to talk about it has led to where we are today. Because if you wash away all the political dogma, if we have a sensible, evidence-based debate about immigration, there are surprising amounts of consensus. Whatever happens with Brexit, if you've chosen to make Scotland your home, you're welcome, and I hope on that we all agree. Thank you, and I call on Ben McPherson to conclude the debate. Thank you, President Officer, and thank you to all who have contributed to this debate about the 223,000 EU citizens from elsewhere in the EU who have uh, done Scotland, uh, done us the privilege of making Scotland their home, and uh, really welcome the supportive statements and valuable contributions and indeed moving stories from across the Chamber uh, and from across all of Scotland about the, the huge contributions that EU citizens and our communities make and to the enhancement of our, our collective culture. I won't be able to respond to all the points made, but I'll, I'll, I, will, I will try my best. I think there are four key things I would, I would like to go through that, that were raised. First of all, uh, the fact that we all welcome EU citizens here and some of the issues that were raised around that. Secondly, fees. Thirdly, the white paper. And then fourthly, differentiated solutions. In terms of uh, welcoming EU citizens, there was a consensus around the, around the chamber of the contribution made by you citizens and I absolutely welcome that in good faith however I think there's a, a conflation going on between guaranteeing those rights in terms of the conservative contributions and the withdrawal agreement the conservative UK government could have guaranteed the rights of EU citizens much much earlier in this process and uh, failed to do that and then when they did make statements were reluctant to come forward with details, showing the underlying point that the Conservatives unfortunately have, and they've admitted this, used EU citizens as a bargaining chip in the negotiations. Secondly, uh, on fees. Now, I think there have been some important points made, but there, apart from the Conservatives, there does seem a consensus around the Chamber that to charge EU citizens a fee to continue to contribute the huge amount that they do to our society and indeed to, to propose a fee for children, I mean, for goodness sake, it is just completely wrong-headed and makes no sense. And to equate it with a passport fee uh, is entirely uh, a misnomer and uh, the, the justification for the UK government on that um, is just without foundation. As members have uh, said, the Scottish Government has been calling, uh, along with many others, for the fee to be abolished. Uh, and the overwhelming message from businesses, 
third sector organisations, EU citizens themselves and many, many others, is that it is unfair for people to have to pay a fee uh, to simply keep their existing rights to live, work and study in Scotland. And uh, in the Chamber today and beyond, I urge as many individuals, businesses, organisations and others as possible to write to the Prime Minister and the Home Secretary to do so, uh, to make this call on social media for the unfair charge to be scrapped and make their voices heard to the UK Government. As members will know, the Scottish Government has committed to doing what it can to help mitigate the hardship of the settled status scheme and to pay the fee for those in public services. And we will come forward with more details on that point. But our clear position is that there shouldn't be a fee. But one of the other barriers we're facing is that there is no way for the Scottish Government to pay the UK Government, and no way for employers to do this either, many of whom wish to do so, to pay the fee directly to the UK Government. This is a nonsensical position. What is also nonsensical is that to pay EU citizens a refund on their fee uh, would need to include a tax element to it because unfortunately the fee is quoted as a taxable benefit. So I call on, I know Adam Tompkins uh, said earlier that he wish he had more influence on his UK colleagues, but I call on him to help make the case that if, if we can't get rid of the fee, let's allow bulk payment and remove the, the, there being a, it being a taxable benefit. On the point of the, uh, the white paper, now I think it's important to emphasise that uh, we in the Scottish Government weren't adequately consulted on the white paper at all and actually uh, we were given very, very little prior notice of it and that is why it's not referenced in the motion uh, but I'm sure we'll come back and have another debate on that uh, at another time. As I have emphasised, our analysis it shows a significant drop in GDP by 2040 as a result of what's being proposed in the white paper, indeed a 6.2% drop in GDP uh, in real GDP, uh, which is a value of almost 6.8 billion a year by 2040. So it would have a devastating effect. And the reaction to the white paper has been very, very concerning from business, from uh, the Scottish Tourism Alliance, the Federation of Small Businesses, SCDI, CBI Scotland, FSB Scotland, all raising huge concerns about what is being proposed in the UK government's white paper on immigration and indeed uh, I, the, the UK hospitality uh, industry was referenced by Conservative members. They are also deeply concerned about what is being proposed. And lastly, uh, there was a, a dismissive approach by many members on the Conservative benches to a differentiated set of solutions for Scotland. And I have to say, today's white paper has really brought many people to a place of much more open-mindedness about differentiated solutions for Scotland. Uh, the the uh, CBI, for example, has said that calls for devolved and regional immigration policies will only grow louder if there aren't changes to what's being proposed in the white paper. The FSB have also stated that uh, there, uh, there is distinct demographic and employment needs in Scotland and that uh, there are uh, there would be a system in Scotland which responds to the particular needs of Scottish indi industry and demography would be uh, potentially welcome. And uh, importantly, uh, SCDI have said a, a more restrictive system uh, means that the case for greater flexibility for Scotland increases. So we have a position here where not only is it important that we as a, as a parliament emphasise how important EU citizens make in their contribution to Scotland, but also that we work together to seek solutions uh, and be constructive in that manner to make a difference for Scotland. And that is what we are in the, in the Scottish Government and indeed in other parties are doing. It would be good if the Scottish Conservatives could show some willingness towards that. Prime Officer, let me conclude by reiterating once again how much this government and I believe this parliament and have confidence in that from today. And indeed, Scotland as a whole welcomes and supports the many EU citizens who have built their lives here and call this their home. 
The story of Scotland's population has long been one of outward migration, of Scots seeking opportunities abroad or being forced to leave their homeland. That's not our national story anymore. And in large part, we have people from other countries and especially those from other EU member states to thank for that. We are in a more positive place because of migration. EU citizens are a welcome and integral part of communities across the country and are valued employees and employers in key sectors such as health and social care, education, construction, tourism and hospitality, culture, rural industries, financial services, agriculture, aquaculture and indeed every other part of our economy. They enrich our society. So I say it again, our friends, neighbours, colleagues and loved ones who are EU citizens, they make a huge contribution that benefits us all. They are welcome in Scotland and we want them to stay in a Scotland that looks out to Europe and to the world in a spirit of friendship, openness and solidarity. Thank you. That concludes our debate on the contribution of EU citizens to Scotland. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 15192 in the name of Graeme Day setting out a business programme. Could I call on Graeme Day to move the motion? Move, presiding officer. Thank you very much. And no one appears to wish to speak against the motion. The question therefore is that motion 15192 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. The next item is consideration of business motion 15193 in the name of Graeme Day on a stage two timetable for a bill. Could I call on Graeme Day to move this motion? Move, presiding officer. Thank you very much. Uh, the question is that motion 15193 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next item is consideration of business motion 15208 in the name of Graeme Day on behalf of the Bureau, extending the stage two timetable for a bill. Could I ask Graeme Day to move this motion? Move, presiding officer. Thank you very much. And the question, therefore, is that motion 15208 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The next item is consideration of Parliamentary Bureau motion 15195 on committee substitutions. Could I ask Graham Day to move this motion? Moved, presiding officer. Thank you very much. We turn now to decision time. The first question is that amendment 15184.2 in the name of Adam Tompkins which seeks to amend motion 15184 in the name of Ben McPherson on the contribution of EU citizens to Scotland be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 15184.2 in the name of Adam Tompkins is yes, 27, no, 90. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that amendment 15184.1 in the name of Claire Baker, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Ben McPherson, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the next question is that motion 15184 in the name of Ben McPherson, as amended, on the contribution of EU citizens to Scotland be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 15184 in the name of Ben McPherson as amended is yes, 90, no, 27, there were no abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed. And the final question is that motion 15195 in the, in the name of Graham Day. No, that's not right. Hang on a sec. 
Yes. Uh, extending the stage two timetable of, of a bill. How much is that one actually? No, hang on a second. It is the contribution, yeah. yes. It's not amended. Though. It's not amended, that's right, yes. It's not, it's not, it's consideration of primary review motion and no, substitutions. Sorry, it is on the, uh, on committee substitutions. Okay, I'll put that one again. The question is that motion 15195 on committee substitutions be agreed. Are we all agreed? And hugely controversial. That concludes decision time. We'll move now to members' business. In the name of Jackie Bailey. Thank you, Jackie. On uh, the Scottish Government to penalise Scots for living alone. We'll just take a few moments for the member and uh, the ministers to change seats. And we will resume. <laughs>